are metabolized by the same enzymes and you have the corresponding analogs competing with each other for these metabolic events and for storage in the membrane phospholipids. All this is reality that you have to keep on the table. And so these highly unsaturated fatty acids uh, can be in your body only to the degree that you eat these foods that provide them. They're essential fatty acids. You can't make them on your own. And so knowing what the proportion of omega-6 and omega-3 is in these fatty acids will prove to be a valuable measure, a marker of tissue status. And if you knew whether it was 50% omega-6 or 80% omega-6 or 20% omega-6, you could start to predict like smoke predicts fire. But I got to also warn you about the facts of the matter. And this came up a little bit yesterday. And that is that there's a distractor. So there's competition for your attention and for your awareness because there are two stories in here. And you heard a lot now about the role of DHA in neural health. And you've heard a bit about the role of omega-6 and omega-3 HUFA in influencing immune inflammatory chronic disorders. And they're both true. And the marketers who are marketing this will really tell you stories about neurite health. The marketers who are dealing with chronic immune inflammatory will tell you about this. And I can tell you for almost 20 years interacting with Norman Salem, uh, I'm saying, Norman, we are just going to have to keep going our own separate ways because Norman was really tremendous in developing this field and bringing bright young people like he Young Kim and Joe Hiblin into, into the force and making this all true. Well, I started 35 years ago in this area in fact, in 1967, I went to Stockholm to work with Bing Samuelson on the formation of these chronic inflammatory immune things. And my background has been in immune inflammatory cardiovascular areas rather than neurophysiology areas. So now I'm going to just go ahead and really hammer at this one. And, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this. But you don't want to be so distracted by this that you forget what the long-term chronic diseases have in them. So this proportion of the HUFA, those, these data are, are, have been out for a long time. And everyone sort of knows. It. Ansel Keys sort of knew this. But he never really talked about omega-3 and omega-6. And it was a tragedy because we've had 40-some years when we could have really been preventing something and we didn't. Uh, we got off and we got on to distractions that were not mediators. But these are mediators of disease. And people who have more than half of their HUFA as omega-6 HUFA, they really have a high incidence of cardiovascular death. Uh, this is not trivial. And people who have less than half of their HUFA uh, in their membrane phospholipids predominantly, they really have low incidence of death. And some people don't like this because, geez, that's transnational and transoceanic and, and all that. But if you look at the Quebec data, they're all people in the same province of the same country. And there's three subpopulations with very different eating habits and very different mortality rates. And these black circles represent quintiles of the 6,128 contro control subjects that are in the freezers and the data banks from the Mr. Fit trial. These are just observational data. Oh, by the way, did you know that middle-aged American males have 
72 to 82% of their hufa has omega-6. But there is one quintile that has a little less omega-6. And by the way, that quintile has a much lower mortality rate. So, you know, the value of some of the information you saw yesterday bring Japan and Greenland fully into focus and realize that this population is extreme and bizarre in its eating habits and accept the fact. Now, the way you find that fact is you do gas chromatography and gas chromatographic people are very proud of all the peaks that they can resolve and they usually report about 35 or 40 different individual peaks and what I want to emphasize is that most of the peaks are not used for clinical interpretations. People don't really care how much palmitate was in that sample. What you care about is how much HUFA was in the sample. And if you take serum phospholipids, just that fraction from the blood uh, serum, and you look, you can see that it's around 15 to 20 percent of the fatty acids that are HUFA. They're the ones you care about. The other 80, 85 percent of the fatty acids are not used for a clinical decision. And so for health risk assessment of an omega-3 deficit, let's just look at these biomarkers. And, and what's really weird is that about all you have to do is there's about seven fatty acids that are seven HUFA that you really need to pay attention to. And all you really need to know is what's the percent that's omega-3 or the percent that's omega-6. Now, another uh, fact of life is that the people who are getting grants to study adding supplemental omega-3 to prevent the problem like to talk about what's the percent of omega-3 in the HUFA. I come from eicosanoid chronic inflammatory thing. I like to talk about the problem in the tissue is the percent of omega-6 that's there. And when you don't have a lot of omega-6 there, you don't have a lot of problems. And when you do have a lot of omega-6 there, you do have a lot of problems. The excessive, irritating mobilization of the omega-6 constitutes the reason why we are talking about omega-3s, because omega-3s displace them in the phospholipids. Indeed, uh, the, the obvious thing is omega-3 is the armor to protect you from the insurgents. And the one thing that the American population is now being educated about is that an insurgency of internal unrest is very different than a traditional military war. And the armor and the personnel that you mobilize to fight an insurgency need to be carefully thought through. All right. So we're going to carefully think this through in terms of how many billions of dollars are we going to mobilize for this kind of internal unrest. Now, we, we know that death is Heart cardiovascular is due to ischemia, thrombosis, arrhythmia, and these are caused by these things, which is caused by the imbalance here. And this chain of events is in thousands of articles already in the medical literature. This is not a dream. This is basic biochemistry that you teach med students when they come through and they all forget it as soon as the semester is over. But I didn't forget it, and you're not going to for a couple of minutes here. And I've simplified it to say, look, if you're imbalanced here, this is going to be imbalanced, and that's going to cause an imbalance in the released insurgents, and then that's going to cause oxidant stress, inflammation, and so on chronically. And when that happens, this is going to happen, and that's going to happen. And that's the connection of cause to consequence. And because this is an inescapable intermediate in the chain of events, it is an excellent, valid surrogate to measure this in order 
to predict that because as much as night follows day and day follows night, this is going to follow that. And that, in turn, followed from this. So here's your intervention. Change this to change that to change that. Two-step transition. But another thing happens uh, on the way to the forum, and that is these mediators also mediate a bunch of other